Hi everyone, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, my name's Matthew McGovern, I'm a committee member of the Scottish Young Lawyers Association. The SYLA are an organisation that's been in existence since 1974 and our role is to represent, educate and entertain young lawyers throughout Scotland. Anybody from a student on the LLB, the BA or the diploma trainees, qualified solicitors and advocates up to 10 years post-qualified experience can be a member and we host a variety of events throughout the year. This year it's been a challenge trying to organise virtual events but one of the advantages that we've had is that it's easier to sign up and that's reflected by the fact that we've had so many signing up uh, this evening. There's a lot of interest in criminal law and a lot of people want to be criminal lawyers. We would hope that the Scottish Government's announcement in December of last year will offer more of you the opportunity to get a criminal traineeship. And this event should be a good starting point about how you go about it. We've got a fantastic panel of speakers. We have Ian Moyer, who is a partner with Moyer and Sweeney Litigation. Ian is also the co-convener of the Law Society's Legal Aid Negotiating Team with responsibility for criminal matters. We've got Gordon Martin, who is the managing partner of Martin Johnson in Scotia. Gordon's a solicitor advocate and leads the biggest criminal legal aid firm in the country. We have Rob Mars, who is the head of education, equality and diversity with the Law Society of Scotland. And we have Lindsay Barber, who undertook the first ever trainee road trip in 2013, traveling 1800 miles to look for a traineeship. She's now a fully qualified solicitor. So we've got a fantastic panel of speakers who you want to listen to, and I'll pass you over to Ian, who will speak first. If anybody has any questions, please put them in the chat facility and have an opportunity for questions at the end. Thank you. Thanks, Matthew. Um, good evening, everyone. A phenomenal turnout, which uh, is quite heartening because for a number of years in the various roles that I've had with the Law Society, I've been banging on about how few people feel that there's a long-term future coming into criminal legal aid. So I'm delighted to see that the interest is definitely still there. And hopefully some of the work that's been done will help you to, to get a traineeship and hopefully you'll get some good advice this evening. Um, I am, amongst other things, uh, as Matthew has said, involved in the legal aid negotiations. I'm also a mentor with the Law Society and I've mentored dozens of people over the years. Um, and most of them, if not all of them, have successfully gone on to get a traineeship. Um, I was involved in the work to secure the option that is now available for people to appear in court after three months. Uh, subject to <coughs> excuse me, subject to various safeguards and so on. Um, so that again, hopefully, will assist in people that are keen to do court work, and help firms to be able to take on trainees to do court work, um, because certainly in the legal aid side of things, there's pretty limited uh, scope for fee earning as a first year trainee under the old regime. Um, so that's obviously been a barrier as well, so hopefully that will help, um, along with the announcement recently, as Matthew says, where we asked the government to make available funding for traineeships with legal aid firms, and I'm pleased to say that the government agreed to put up a million pounds to part fund 40 traineeships. The final details of that are not entirely known, but I'll let Rob speak to you later on uh, about what's involved in that. <clears throat> I thought I might just briefly tell you about my own experience of a traineeship, which wasn't perhaps the model of how to go about it. And I'm sure you will all have a better experience than I did. I kind of left at lastminute.com, unlike you guys who are all much more switched on these days and spent my summer after I'd finished the diploma, just kind of doing a summer job and enjoying the sunshine and what have you. And I bumped into somebody in October and they asked where I was doing my traineeship. And I said, well, I probably should start thinking about trying to get one. But the look of horror because traineeships were as difficult to get then as they are now. And I went across and there was one on the board at Glasgow University and I thankfully went for it and got it. 
but it was uh, perhaps not the most attractive one to others because it was in Grand Hill and Black Hill, which were fairly wild at the time, to put it mildly. So my baptism of fire included my car getting broken into not once but twice on my first day of my traineeship. Went and got the window replaced, came back up. Ten minutes later, the secretary said, your window's been fanned in on your car. I said, I know I've had it fixed. She said, no, they broke the same one again. So uh, that was an expensive first day. Day three, the civil assistant left, so I was handed the branch office keys for the Black Hill office and told to go and make it make money. Uh, with zero support, I set about thinking on my feet, got the old boy that lived in the flat upstairs who was in trouble pretty much every day to teach me how to fill in legal aid forms. That's a true story, by the way. I did get taught by a client how to do it. Uh, he got so impatient. Just give them here, son, and I'll show you what to do. Um, dog set on me because people thought that I was coming to cut off the lecky. So it was duly dispatched down the close stairs to chase after me and as I made for safety into the office and slammed the door shut like something out of a Tom Cruise movie, they came up shouting, Gyro, down! The dog was called Gyro. So I hope that your traineeships will be better supervised than mine. Day one with a gown on my back consisted of appearing in front of Lady Grey in the JP court in the morning and doing a stipendiary magistrate trial in the afternoon. I won the trial but through no ability of my own. In fact, the magistrate had to tell me to sit down and stop making it any worse. <laughs> so, um, the big thing about that is ask for help. Always ask for help. Um, people will always help you if you talk to them in a court and say, can I run this past you? Um, so uh, hopefully you got a better finishup than that. I could tell you some worse stories, but we don't have a lot of time. So. I'm more interested in hearing how to get a traineeship than hearing how mine was. <clears throat> CV, you all have to um, have a CV, but don't, don't just have one, one covering letter because you will be applying for all sorts of jobs, all sorts of firms, and there's no point if you've been trying clearly to get into corporate law and you haven't succeeded in coming along to me and saying, you're the only team I've ever wanted to play for when there's no criminal experience at all or whatever. If that's the situation, just be honest about it. Say, initially I thought I would be interested in doing corporate law, but if you can get me a traineeship, I'll put my shoulder to the wheel and I'll give you everything I've got. Um, so don't have, as I say, one CV that goes out to everybody, or one covering letter that goes out to everybody. And another very common mistake that I find people make is that somewhere on page two is the actual selling point of view. Um, so, you know, whatever you think your best point is on your experience so far, get that in early. Because if, if you're putting in an application for an advertised job, one of these 40 places that come up, there'll be dozens and dozens and dozens of applications going in. The reality is most people will not read all of the application, there's been nothing standing out in it. So get your standout point in early. Um, I mean, I had somebody, for example, that uh, spoke to me and right at the very end of their CV, it said that they were actually a um, court worker for a high court judge. Now, what better thing could you have to try and impress me that you know something about the law than that you have worked for the last two years in a judge's office. And it was literally lost in the last paragraph, one sentence. So those are the kind of things that you've got to try and make sure that you're getting your best foot forward as early as you can. When it comes to the interview itself, prepare for the interview properly. Learn about the firm. And that doesn't just mean you know, having a quick trawl on the website. Try and see if you can find out a bit more about the people that are likely to be interviewing you, the kind of work that they do. If you do have a shared interest, don't spend the whole interview talking about it, but get it in there somewhere. If you know, if, if I'm interested in, in golf and you've played golf or whatever it is, um, you know, for example, if you were coming for an interview with me, you would know now that I'm involved in the legal aid work. You might 
ask me a question about that. Don't turn it all into being about the person that's interviewing you, but show that you've actually done a bit of homework about the firm. So, you know, if they won an award last year, drop that in. I see you won High Street Law Firm of the Year or whatever it was. Um, presentation, it, it might sound daft, but, you know, presentation really does matter. Um, make sure that you're smart, but not trendy. Make sure you look like you're going for an interview as a lawyer rather than that you're going to a wedding or your boy band or whatever the female equivalent of that is. You know, buying a crisp white shirt or a you know tenner out of supermarket is money well spent or whatever the equivalent is for the ladies. You know, make sure that you look as if you're you're presentable because one of the things that you need to remember is that. I'm going to take a trainee on, I'm going to have to let them loose on the clients. So I want them to be presentable. I want them to be able to speak well, okay, to learn. Um, you know, if you're asked that question, uh, most criminal lawyers are unlikely to ask you legal questions in my experience. But if you are asked a question and you don't know the answer, just say you don't know. Don't make something up. That's a hundred times worse. Um, just be honest and say, I really don't know that, but I would be interested in learning about it or whatever. You don't need to be the finished article. You're going for a traineeship, so nobody's going to expect you to know every single piece of law. I don't know every single piece of law or anything. Get it? So you want to come across as somebody who's keen and willing to listen and willing to learn, rather than somebody who's going to tell me how to do the job every, t every 10 minutes. Remember that the person that takes you on is going to be working closely for two years with you, training you. So you have to be willing to listen and learn from them rather than constantly raining against them. Nobody's going to take you on if they think you're just going to give them a hard time every day and tell them that you anything because I read a book at uni. Books you read at uni don't teach you how to deal with clients. Don't teach you how to deal with real life problems that you'll face. I know some of the faces that I can see on the screen uh, I actually recognise. Um, some people have been trying for a long time to get a traineeship. It's really important that you don't let desperation show. Go to that interview as if it's the, the interview that you've just been waiting for. It's your first one, you're up for it, you know what you're doing. Don't go in there looking broken. Um, I mean, I met a student uh, who couldn't get a traineeship several years ago and met him, spoke to him and we were quite honest at the end of it and said, look, it's just coming across that you don't think you're going to get a traineeship anymore. You know, you've lost that spark because you've been for half a dozen or more interviews that you nearly got and, you know, all it needed was for somebody to point that out to him and the very next interview that he went to, he got finished his traineeship about six months ago and has already been made an associate with the firm. So there's somebody with great talent that just needed reminded that you're good at this, you can do it. Again, practice before you go for the interview. People have nervous traits, don't even notice that they've got. Um, I remember speaking to another guy who came in for a mock interview and spoke well and what have you, but at the end of the that he said um, how did I get on I said okay apart from the fact that you must have taken your glasses off put them on my desk and put them back on literally about 300 times didn't even know he was doing it again had, had failed to get a, a traineeship at a number of interviews as soon as we pointed that out went to the next interview got a traineeship be willing to look at am I doing this right don't just assume that you are take help from people practice get better at it. It's a, it's a skill like any other. The more you do it, the better you get at it. And then you get to your traineeship itself. Um, court work is demanding, but it's also interesting, varied and exciting work. Um, you know, something different pretty much every day. As I said at the beginning, you'll always get help if you ask nicely at the court. Any lawyer will take the time to spend five minutes you run something past them um, that you're really not sure of. You won't always be able to get hold of your training partner when you're at court. 
it's not always possible. So you, you just ask anybody and they will help you. Your reputation is absolutely everything in court work in particular. It's very easily uh, lost, but it's, you know, something that you, you, you work hard to get that reputation with the judges, with the fiscals and with your other colleagues. Um, one of the mistakes that some people have made over the years that I've seen regularly is having the attitude of, well, it's only a secretary or it's only a bar officer or it's only a clerk. There's no such thing. These people are your biggest ally and they are as, every bit as important to the working of the court as you are. So win with the right attitude. Apart from anything else, that, that only a bar officer is the person that goes and speaks to the sheriff and says, hi, they're brand new, they're trying their best. Um, they're, having tr they're trying to sort this out. Or oh, he's, he's saying you're rubbish down there. Um, so just be careful what you're doing, particularly on social media as well. Um, as I said, be open to learn at all times. Every day is a school day. Even now I learn stuff from watching other lawyers. Sometimes it's how to do a thing really well. Other times it's just a, a wee small stylistic thing that you think, well, that was good. I'll, I'll, I'll use that myself. And other times it's learning how not to do it. Um, I remember years ago watching a, a lawyer who had pled guilty to simple possession of drugs, having a ham-fisted attempt at a plea in mitigation by saying to Sheriff Mitchell, who was a man not to be messed with in Glasgow Sheriff Court back in the day, I will, you see, the thing was, um, it's okay because he's, he's not really a drug user, he was going to give it to somebody else. It was a far more serious crime, it wasn't mitigation at all. Um, so that was a good one to learn from, as was watching a lawyer telling a sheriff that although his client had been uh, done for a number of housebreakings and had a terrible record for housebreaking, he used the phrase, it's okay, my lord, because he picks his victims very selectively. He only ever breaks into commercial premises because they'll have insurance. <laughs> Not a good line. Didn't work. So... Um, Learn at all times, just be willing and open to do that. And basically the simple rule that I try and tell every young lawyer or every colleague that I, I have is, I actually use the F word, but I won't do that on here. Work hard and give a damn. Basically it speaks for itself, but if you work hard, you treat every case as if it's your, your dad's, your brother's, your mother's, your sister's, your pal. You treat all the clients with respect. You do your best for them. You will not go wrong. So, well, good luck in your hunt for a traineeship. I'll pass it over to who's next. Pass to Robin. Rob. Thank you. Thank you, Ian, um, and thank you to everyone for coming. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Yes. Good. Thank you. See, so, yeah, uh, I'm Rob uh, Mars. I'm head of education at the Law Society. Um, and I'm the only person on the call who is not a criminal defence lawyer, so I, 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 won't, I won't speak for as, uh, as long as the others. Um, my two involvements, if you like, in particularly focusing on criminal defence, one was working with Ian and the wider team on moving to early admission and really learning a lot about the, the process there. Um, it's, it may, I mean, there's many terrible things that have happened over the last 18 months. Um, but uh, one minor downside or one significant downside for the, the, the legal profession was we just brought uh, early admission in and then about four months later the, the country went into lockdown um, and we'd really hoped that one of the upsides to that would have been uh, seeing more people move into criminal defence at an earlier stage because they'd be more remunerative. There are longer term structural issues of course and I'm, Ian and, and others will be better placed than me to speak about those but um, hopefully when things return to normal, if they return to normal, um, that will kick back in and we'll see some benefit for that for, for our members and for future members. And then as Ian mentioned earlier, as I'm sure you've all seen, there was a, as part of a wider package, the society's negotiating with, um, with the government. And again, I can only speak to one element of that. Um, the, the government has come forward and said they'll fund, uh, or part fund up to 
40 traineeships over the next two years. And as Ian said, we're, we're finalizing the details on that, how it will actually work, the amounts that firms will be able to get, um, any hoops that firms need to jump through. Our, um, our default position, I think, is uh, fewer hoops would be better. Um, it sometimes feels like um, that isn't uh, always the way, but what we're, we're trying to do is make it as easy as possible for firms to be able to get hold of that funding when it when it comes into fruition and be able to go out there and under, and know for that for the next two years that they will have a trainee that is part subsidized and already we've had um i think eight or nine firms come to us and say look we'd be interested in in hearing more i think that's probably a little on the light side um i think others will be waiting till it's formally announced with a go live date and and so on but even so, we've even you know in in the midst of let's face it a fairly terrible economic situation with courts closing and um, and all the things that come with it, we've had a, a decent number already come forward and say we'd like to 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 be on the list for this when you go live. And of course, what I don't know is whether it's a one one time offer of forty over the next two years or if that would ever be repeated. But I think we've got to assume for the moment that it's a one off. Um, hopefully it's not, but let's just assume for the moment it's a one-off. Um, I can't really go into too many of the details here because they're still uh, being panned out, but um, all I can assure you is that um, any any delay has not been from the society side of things. Um, I've probably learned more about legal aid finance in the last uh, eight weeks than I, I ever thought I would ever know, um, but we're trying our best to, to get that over the line because what we no, I'm an educationist by background. Nobody goes into education to limit young people's chances. Uh, quite the opposite, and you know that's what we would we'd love to see that come to fruition. So some of you guys can go out and get traineeships at criminal defence firms. The the other thing I'd speak about briefly, although as I say, Ian, Ian Lindsay, and Gordon are the real real experts. I mean, are here. Is just you know I, I now have a decade of experience in the profession and, and advising people on how to to move into into roles of all sorts from trainee up to up to uh, oh, I suppose up to partner in a way and uh, from across the sector I'd echo pretty much everything Ian said um, it's re I'm I'm constantly amazed by the things I see in CVs and letters and you'll all shake your head and think, well, I, I would never do that. Um, but honestly, I see it all. Um, I remember one friend who works for a criminal defense firm in FIFO, I won't name them, uh, rang me up and uh, started ranting down the phone at me. So well, what's this about? He's like, what are you telling them? What are you telling these law students? So I was like, oh, genuinely, uh, I'm not, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Then he, he read out that basically got a letter saying, I've got a long, ha long held ambition to be a commercial solicitor. And he was like, well, fine but why why are you writing to my small criminal defense firm and we all understand that you know um nobody grows up wanting to be a trainee solicitor it's a means to an end it's a means to becoming a solicitor um and in a way of course you will all have your dream uh, traineeship but you know uh sometimes uh the second best dream is is, is what you want uh, and you'll take uh, the perfect should never be the enemy of the good so uh, you'll take another traineeship, of course, but you know Ian's absolutely right that that that, ten, uh, that um, making sure uh, that the, that your application is proper and correct um, and targeted and tailored. I realise it's really basic. I realise it takes a lot of time, um, but it, it does make a difference, and people do notice. Absolutely echo what Ian said that we've all been for jobs. Um, I've I've got some jobs successfully in my career. I have uh, been on the the other side of that discussion as well, where you get the disappointing letter having put a, an absolute shed load of effort in, and you have that dawning realization that you took four hours to craft the perfect covering letter, and they probably spent you know forty five seconds or something, if you're lucky, looking over it. Um, uh, and it's a balance, of course, but you know try to try to do that. I, I think. The, the question I ask whenever I recruit anyone is is a really simple one is why do you want the job now of course uh, because I've got a rent or a mortgage to pay is you know an understandable answer sometimes and of course in, when it comes to a traineeship uh, some some people even if it's not the dream traineeship will say you know because I you know I, I need a traineeship to qualify as a solicitor that's understandable 
but ultimately if if you really want it you should be able to to explain why you want that job you should be able to it should it should burst out of you you know we're not all extroverts of course but it should, it should sing off the page it should it should be really really clear why you want to be a criminal defense lawyer or a commercial lawyer or you know mergers and acquisitions if that's your thing probably not if you're on this call but um you know it should really jump out and deep down whenever i've spoken to any solicitor and whenever you know that will that will merge into the thousands over the over the years um it comes back to clients helping clients getting the clients uh what, what they they need and deserve and so on um and really showing an interest there so when it comes to criminal law i think ian was spot on talk about um what, you know ian i think everybody knows there's a lot for the law society i think he you know i was amazed it took him quite so long to mention golf um but um you know uh, really it's it is important to research the firm properly like if they've been involved in a big case or they've had a big win or they uh specialize in white collar crime or a particular sort of crime that should be you know front and center in your mind firstly because you want to work there but secondly just to show that you've done that research the other things I've heard over the years that, crim uh, that particularly criminal defense firms, I think this is true of many, many businesses as it happens. I, I remember one of my committees, uh, I worked with a, a solicitor advocate at a, a criminal defense firm. And his view was it's really, really important for, for those moving into criminal legal aid or criminal defense to understand the business model of criminal defense. And as he put it at the time, in many ways, he said, although I'm part of the same profession as CMS Cameron McKenna, um my business model is much closer to the florist next door um and he said that's not to do down the florist or do down cms Cameron mckenna it's just to to be to be truthful that we are a small business and um we can't be too high and mighty and he said you know he he'd had interns before who enjoyed the the sexy side of things when it came to criminal law didn't enjoy you know some of the less sexy side of things like sitting on reception or uh making tea or so on and he was like I'm a partner of 20 years standing. I have to do that sometimes. So, um, uh, you know, it, it, it is a sort of more rounded experience. But the, for me, from everything I hear, very early on, you're dealing with people, you're dealing with clients, which is not the case in the same way at the larger firms. So for me, that that's what I'd come back to. And also, Ian's point spot on again about the if there's something that's unique to you that makes you different to everyone else, you know, shout about it. If that's a second language, and it may be that some clients would prefer to be have initial instruction or at least a welcome in another language, that that's a huge for me. That's a huge one, but there could be any number of things. You know, I've known people who've uh, come from other careers and you know say, well, you know, I'm I'm really really good at admin. Trust me, anyone who's good at admin wants to take uh, legal aid firms want because they, hopefully uh, it makes legal aid processes a bit simpler, um, and and simple, simple is not perhaps the word you would normally use for them. Um, and uh, on top of that, you know, I've seen examples where people have had careers or backgrounds in building social media brands or websites or what have you. The sort of business that many small legal aid firms are, anyone who can has that extra string to their bow is huge. So it doesn't have to be legal, but, for, but legal matters too. So if you do have that cab experience, that clinical experience, what, any work experience that shows you're there, shows you're there uh, interested is, is key. The final thing I'll say before moving on uh, to the next speaker is that it, it, everybody understands how difficult it is right now for LLB and diploma graduates. It, it, um, you know, we are not living in a normal situation. My normal advice would be you know, if you're in Glasgow, get down to Carton Place, knocking on doors and uh, go go to the Sheriff's Court um, and get as much experience of watching as you can. And obviously that, that's much harder at the moment because of the situation that we're all living through. The other thing I'd normally say is, as well as that is get out there and network. So obviously you're here tonight, but there are so many great organisations in the profession like the SLA, like TANK, like the Glasgow Bar Association that put on free or cheap uh, CPD. I'm not going to punt you to expensive providers, I don't think that's fair, but many of the legal organisations, people like the GBA, love the idea of students or, or, 
or recent graduates coming to their events. And I know obviously the SY they set up to do that because that's their reason to be. But what a great way to learn more about um, the, the the profession that you want to join. And then when when hopefully we get back into into real life meetings, get down there to the GBA meetings, the EBA meetings, the Aberdeen Bar Association meetings, because that's where you meet somebody. And then when you have a speculative application, it's not quite so speculative because you can say, we met at, you know, whatever it might be. So I would get out there and network. And get it, the worst thing that can happen is you learn a lot about the law. I mean, that's pretty good. That the best thing that can happen is you meet somebody who might help you into the next role. So happy to take any questions, but um, in the, in uh, but maybe wait till the end for that. So thank you very much for having me. And you know, from everybody at the society, best of luck. We know how difficult it is right now. Thanks very much, Rob Gordon. Uh, hi, hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, Ian and Rob have said everything that I want to say, so I should stop now. Uh, and that will speed up everything, but that's not the way to deal with stuff. When Matthew asked me uh, to speak about uh, finding a traineeship, uh, I thought that would be good to try and help people achieve that. And then when I got home, I realised that I got my traineeship in 1982. Times have changed a bit since then. Uh, there were no global pandemics. We didn't have a joker as prime minister. It was a better place. What Ian said about tailoring your applications to the firms that you apply to is essential. There is nothing more annoying than somebody saying how they had always wished in their covering letter to do commercial work when if they're in their second year of their traineeship with us, they'll be dealing with people fighting in the street. It may be the same as commercial litigation, but it doesn't pay as much. It's also important, once we can get back to doing it, that you try and get as much work experience over as many different areas as possible. I don't expect in an application I receive that people will necessarily have had much work experience in crime. But what would be of interest to me is whether or not they've tried to have work experience of any sort and whether throughout university they also worked and if they had contact with members of the public. Because although we're all going to be lawyers and we're going to represent people in court, you still have to be in a position to deal with individuals as individuals. Uh, indeed, the more complicated or difficult the job that you might have had when you were a student, it might make you more attractive. If you're used to dealing with people in pubs, if you're used to dealing with people in hospitality in general or in shops, you'll be used to dealing with people who can be difficult, who can be awkward, who can be obnoxious. And that might only be the lawyers that you're training with, never mind the clients that you'll have to see. So it's a good experience to have that ability to deal with members of the public. It's also important that you're persistent. Although I didn't travel the length and breadth of Scotland to get a traineeship, I seem to have a vague recollection that I sent about 150 applications and ended up with five interviews. And uh, there were no word processors. I had to write that all out by hand. So it was quite tiring. And the point is you shouldn't give up. And it's important that you don't go and try and, pardon my French, bullshit someone when you're being interviewed by them. If you've not got any work experience in a criminal firm, that doesn't matter. As long as you're prepared to accept that you're honest and explain why you want to be a lawyer. After all, that's the thing that we're really interested in. You want to be a lawyer. And it's important that you remember that. I still enjoy my work each and every day. Uh, it's more difficult just now because there isn't as much court work uh, and I spend all my time uh, on Zoom calls or WebEx or things like that, uh, where you conduct jury trials through a cinema screen where there is less contact with members of the public, less contact with the people that you're attempting to persuade 
to do what you think they should do for your client or for yourself. But the point is, it's important to be persistent, to be honest, and if you don't know, say you don't know. Ian's 100% right that at court, if you don't know what you're doing, you should ask for advice. You should be prepared to ask for advice. And if you don't know what you're doing when you're speaking to a client, you should be prepared to say, I'm not certain about that. I'll need to ask someone. I'll need to look it up. Realistically, most people want the correct answer. And if you don't know it, you're better off saying you don't know and go and get that advice. The pandemic did stop uh, the latest group of trainees getting into court and how cases are now being dealt with will probably also make it difficult for uh, first year trainees to get into court to do the sort of simple things that they would have been allowed to do with the change in the rules. But there will still be opportunities for people to appear in court. There will still be opportunities to do challenging things. And if the government eventually tells us how they will fund the traineeships and what hoops we have to go through, then there will be people who will be employed. For my firm, I, I was looking on our website today and of the 12 lawyers who are on the website, six of them were either, in fact, six of them were trainees at the firm. Some have remained throughout, some have gone away and then come back. And what you're looking to do is to, as an employer, find somebody that you can train, somebody that you can rely on, and assuming it's a mutually beneficial arrangement and relationship, you would want to keep that person. It's important for the sake of the profession in general that even legal aid firms take on trainees wherever they can, because if you don't, you won't have anyone who can do the work that you require them to do. And although I'm closer to retirement than uh, anybody else, hopefully on this call, uh, the position is that I still want to do the best I can for my client. I still want to appear in court and be thought of as a good lawyer. But more importantly, I still want to make money and only by having reliable staff that you can trust who will do the best that they can, are you able to do that? In reality, although I joked at the start that Rob and Ian have said most of the things that I require to say, that's true. If you were to come to be interviewed by me, you should remember not so much about golf, but about football. And to upset Matthew, my team's on the TV at 7.45 on Sky, so I need to see that. So we'll be keen to get through the questions as quickly as possible. And uh, I'll, I'll then pass over to the next speaker. And again, I'm more than happy to accept questions that don't interfere with kickoff. I'm tempted to keep you on the call after that, Gordon, but- I'll I think you'll very... discover my Wi-Fi might go down. <laughs> I'll move very quickly on to Lindsay, thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, firstly, I have to say that given you're all students, your uh, abodes all look immaculate. So you're doing student life properly. Um, I'm at a bit of a disadvantage because my boss is on this call. So I have to be um, polite if I want to have an office tomorrow. I've also just realised that I'm on the cusp for getting kicked out of the SYLA threshold age-wise. So I'm probably, this is my last opportunity to speak, thanks to Matthew. I did a traineeship road trip um, eight years ago next month because there were traineeships. There weren't many and I wasn't getting them. Um, I thought I wanted to do crime. I was convinced I wanted to do crime, but I just thought a traineeship is better than, than nothing. You know, you can become an expert down the line. I could have ended up doing crofting law in WIC. Thankfully, that didn't happen. Um, I had a really, really mixed bag as a trainee. I did civil, really honking civil stuff as well. Um, judicial reviews, court sessions stuff. Just 
hospital pass really and I'm just going to be candid with you um, it was grueling and then you do crime and you feel like you're going to get carried out on somebody's shoulders after your first jury speech it is absolutely worth it I think the best thing to do is I'm obviously working with Ian I've worked with Ian for a year uh, next month looking forward to my flowers and champagne that's going to be waiting on 17th of February Ian just to remind you um, but I work in Govan now um, and there is a real baptism of fire when you work in Govan because the clients are brutally honest and they're brilliant. They come in with their dogs. Sometimes they come in just to chat to you. It's a people management thing. It's massive because we are no better or worse than the people we represent. Everybody has a history. Everybody deserves the best you can be. Now, there are days when there are not enough hours and the glory that you see on TV is about as far removed <laughs> as you can imagine. And there are 226 of you on this call just now and you're all fighting the same fight and you're all seeing each other at events and you're all going for the same interview and you're having to congratulate people through gritted teeth for getting the job that you want. There are so many social media platforms out there now. I'm too old for half of them. Like I can't even spell TikTok. But there are ways that you can put yourself forward. The pandemic has crippled everything. And I can appreciate how frustrating it is when all you're seeing online is lawyers don't make money and everything's negative and everything's doom and gloom. All you need to do is just remember that you'll do something great in the job and you'll feel amazing. And then something really, really small will set you back. Chat to everybody if you're ever in best examples of basement in Glasgow Sheriff Court. You can ask a question in there and get five or six different answers. People have a different interpretation and a different perception. Um, I am very, very lucky. I, I didn't have a clue how I was going to get the job. I just knew that I was. Didn't know what job and I didn't know where. And my sense of geography is terrible. When I eventually realised how far Wictowigton was going to be, I regretted it, but I committed myself to it. I put myself out there. And there have been some major highs. I mean, my first jury, it was a day, it was really a summary trial. But, you know, there were members of the public there. I did my speech and it felt incredible. You just remember why you do it. And it is draining. And you see people getting ahead that you feel sometimes because you're human don't deserve it. But the people that want it, it's very, very apparent. I've got people on here and people who contact me still after I've done it for this length of time who are dejected, who are to me are the perfect candidate. And there is a firm out there for you. You might not fit for somebody or commercially, they might not have been able to take you on at the time. But approach people, just introduce yourself. There's something about everybody that is employable and it sets you apart from the other 200 and odd people on this. Um, it's really, really worth it. Um, not if you like sleep, but don't overthink. Um, there are, Ian's laughing because he actually suggested a certain pillow I should use because of my insomnia. That's how you know you've got a good boss. Um, silly questions are worth asking because if you think you know what you're doing, it could be an expensive lesson for you and your employers down the line. Um, I learn by repetition, unfortunately, and I need things to be told to me about 20 times, but you get there. I, um, I think that it's very easy to be dejected just now because anywhere you look, everything is horrible. But if we can do anything, and I mean the collective we, my firm can do anything, even a message on LinkedIn, send us your CV, do something, just chat to us because we're, well, we do want to help. I want to see all of you in court. Um, maybe not the really glamorous people, if you could just take a back seat, that would be quite pleasant. But you will, I can't wait, like, I obviously can't see all of you, but if you ever see me in court or in passing, then I can help or you want a coffee, then obviously you'll buy it. But just let me know if I can help. Okay, guys. Cheers. Thanks very much, Lindsay, and thanks to everybody that spoke. Hey.
there have been a few questions sent in. I'll start with this question. Are there any materials you would recommend to re prepare us for a criminal traineeship to spruce up and or aid our undergraduate in diploma knowledge? I'm going to cheat slightly by answering the question myself. The Devil's Advocate by Ian Morley QC is a fantastic book on beginner's advocacy. It's the book that everybody recommended to me when I started and it's a book that I'll recommend to you. Lindsay, I don't know if you want to come in on that. I think this sounds quite tragic, but if you look at the Scott Court, Court's website, quite often there are really recent cases which are interesting, so it's not necessarily a set guide, but it's what's happening as it's happening. So if you do, when we do get out of this pandemic and you're up to date with your knowledge for who you're speaking to, that's quite an attractive prospect for people that you're current, as well as rolling out the old standard, it's good for people to see that you know what's happening in the now and then. Um, Thanks. Matthew. Rob. Hi, it's Rob. I was just going to say, um, I second everything both you and Lindsay have said. Um, I, I think um, Lindsay and her uh, talk um, mentioned the importance of social media. And one thing I've noticed over over the last few years is it's very, it's, it's, uh, I think Scottish legal Twitter, I mean, it, it can be uh, brutal, um, but on the whole, it's a fairly friendly place. And um, I think um, it, it's easy for, or it can be easy for committed people to, uh, to get in amongst that, make contacts through it, but also learn a lot. I mean, uh, you know, people, uh, people on this call, uh, people we've alluded to on this call are, are practicing every day. They're in court every day. They're doing the interesting and important cases. And they'll be, you know, on occasion, they'll be writing about them for our website, for their own website, for blogs and so on. Other people will be commenting on it. So there's loads and loads of free up-to-date material that builds on the, 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 the Scott Court resources that, that Lindsay's absolutely right to mention. And then there's discussion about it where, you know, you know, I could imagine you, Matthew, saying this is what I thought about a case on Twitter that, you know, you might not have been acting in, but you, you were interested in. And then others coming in with viewpoints. Now, there's no reason at all that a law student couldn't jump in and but over time become a, a, a well-kent face. But even if they just lurk and read, they're learning. Yeah. Just for the record, Rob, I've never read a case to offer an opinion on, but I take your point about Scottish Legal Twitter. It is a fantastic resource. I, this is the next question. When preparing for a criminal traineeship interview, should I prepare to discuss recent case law or is it more prudent to prepare challenging fa challenges faced by the sector? Gordon, I don't know if you want to come in on that. If you prepare for recent case law, you may embarrass me by knowing more about it than me. <laughs> so you might teach me something, that would be quite good, but equally you should also be aware of the challenges facing the profession and the fact that the criminal defence bar is filled with old men and we're all going to die at some stage and there'll be nobody to defend anyone. And Ian? I was just too depressed after listening to that last <laughs> bit from Gordon. <laughs> no, I, I think um, most uh, criminal lawyers are unlikely to start expecting you to know current cases obviously the more prepared you can be the better but for me the focus would be on learning about the firm that you're asking to invest two years of their time in um you know what, what why you know, why are you going to sell yourself to me as the person i should take on if i've got 75 applications the fact that you've read a case that came out today isn't necessarily going to convince me that that makes you the right candidate for the job as, you know, as Lindsay said you can go on the website and it will have the 50 most recent judgments or the UK Supreme Court website will have today's judgments I might be quite impressed to the extent that you've kept up to date with things but it's not going to make me say right well I actually thought this other person was much more interested in engaging with our firm and seem to have a basic understanding of the economics of I'm going to have to earn some fees to justify my keep. Then those are more the kind of things that I'm going to be interested in. Are you going to understand the importance of making sure that you actually got legal aid granted? 
rather than, oh, well, I filmed the foreman, but I forgot to put it on online, so you're not getting paid, or I forgot to get an increase, or I, I told you that I got sanctioned. Thanks. And this was another. You want... This was another question that came in from somebody who is a criminal justice undergrad, and they're looking at alternative routes into the profession from a non-legal degree. Rob, I don't know if you've got any insight into that. Um, theoretically, yeah. I mean, there is. Uh, a route into the profession called the, the pre-peak training contract, or, or as most people call it, the pre-diploma training contract, and that's somebody working for a law firm for three years. Normally, it's somebody who's been working in the firm as a, uh, an, a, a, a you know, secretary or court runner or you know, office admin or somebody, um, and they get taken on this contract. They get um, exposure to certain areas of law I think there's three prescribed areas and, and crime, I think, is one of them. And they have to sit exams with the Law Society and then uh, they, they then do the diploma uh, and, and then complete a, a traineeship at a higher sort of advanced level. Um, I say theoretical because they do happen, um, but they happen very rarely. I mean, 10 a year. Um, and I, I have never seen anyone advertise for it. It's something that happens if you're working for a firm, um, uh, generally. Uh, in term, we're looking at an apprenticeship route to qualification, um, but you know that that's going to be some time away. So, uh, realistically, the the ways in at the moment are the LLB or the accelerated LLB, um, or requalifying from another jurisdiction. Of course, I know there have been some reforms in England and Wales that have. Um, radically changed how you become a solicitor down there. Um, I think whenever a society staff member speaks, they should remember should remind people they are a, a function of the society, if you like. Uh, I know what the Education and Training Committee's views are of the English reforms as it happens. I personally agree with them. I, I'm not sure they would aid access. I'm not sure long term they're going to aid access to the profession, despite that being the, the public. Thing. So, in short, not not really, I'm afraid. Thanks. Another question we've had is, what's the appropriate length of a covering letter? Should it be one or two pages or possibly more? Lindsay? I sent out 150 to tailored firms, so there, there were never more than three quarters of a page um, because people have certain recruiters and employers have certain things they're looking for and they scan them. It's heartbreaking when you're putting blood, sweat and tears into them. Um, but I would imagine the shorter, the better. It should be pretty punchy. Um, I never did anything. Then again, it took me forever to get a traineeship. So maybe Ian and Gordon will have a different view on that. But, you know, less no, is more. I, I would definitely say no more than a page. If mm -hmm. it's gone on to page two, you've lost me. Yeah, if you can't get the message over in the first page, what's the point? Yeah, uh, it's four no's, as opposed to two pages. <laughs> I, um, uh, I, I, I use the example of our chief exec. I've seen her CV. Uh, she shared it at something. Her, I know CV is slightly different from her covering that. If a, if a CEO of a professional body with a, a extensive professional career behind that can fit everything on two pages I'm, I'm pretty certain uh, anyone getting their first job out of university uh, or first professional job out of university probably can too I think yeah the you, you want to cover the basics and not a lot more you know um, get them interested and then shine an interview but two pages people probably aren't even going to turn onto the second page Sorry for those of you who've got four page seat covering letters that you're going to have to go and tweak, but that, that's a brutal honesty and it's better to know that than not, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And how important is advocacy experience when you're applying for a traineeship? Uh, is that something you would look for, Ian? Um, I, I think really when, once you get to that stage, it's probably if you've got a short list of three or four candidates, and other ways of separating them, you might look at something like that. 
um, you know, what it does demonstrate is an interest, you know, say, for example, you've won a mooting contest or something, that's the sort of thing, um, you know, I'm the world debating champion, well, you're not going to put that on page three of a covering letter, that's, that's you know, that shines through, but it's more about what, what can you put in that covering letter that's going to make me even bother bringing you for an interview. Once you come to the interview, I'm going to know whether you can speak well or not, because I'm going to be on the other side of the desk. I'm going to know whether you're going to be a blubbering wreck or whether you'll be able to go into the cells and see a client who's asking who the F you are, where's Mr. Moyer, etc. How are you going to deal with that? Are you robust enough to do that? Because it is challenging at times when you go and see a client in the cells and the coming down off drugs and you're the guy who's got to tell them that they're not getting well, you're not going to get out today. So I'm more interested in that kind of advocacy, the people skill side of it. Are you going to be able to talk them around and explain to them why it is that because when I got you bail yesterday and said that's the absolute last chance, you went straight out and got to jail again, that's why you're not getting bail today, you know, and make them understand that. And you'd be amazed how often that happens. Um, you know, so that's kind of the advocacy I'm interested in rather than, you know, the theory of it. I, I, I spoke at a contest at uni, well, okay, but, you know, in reality, are you going to manage a difficult client? What about you, Gordon? I, I agree with Ian. I, I don't see that it, if it was... If there were equally qualified candidates and somebody had won a moot or was, as Ian suggested, the world debating championship, that might get them the job. But it's to begin with, I'm interested in whether or not you can deal with people. If you can deal with people, appearing in court will eventually come to you without any trouble because, after all, you're dealing with people in court as well. You're dealing with a sheriff, you're dealing with a fiscal, you're dealing with your client. If you can deal with difficult people skillfully, then you will be a good court lawyer. Another question we've had sent in, are there any sites or resources that aspiring lawyers should be signing up to and keeping an eye on to ensure that they're up to date with criminal law news? I think Rob's already touched on this, but Lindsay, I don't know if you want to add anything. LinkedIn. Is great. I think more and more people are using that as a resource um, in the legal sector in Scotland. You constantly see free events posted there. Um, obviously, because I'm not a student anymore, I'm not as um, in touch with the unis, but LinkedIn is very, very good because you can see who's sharing it, who's commenting on it. I, I'm starting to see the same names for people I don't necessarily know, but that I know are looking for traineeships. And it seems to be quite a proactive resource for people. Twitter is very good as well. Um, obviously a bit more informal, but LinkedIn is certainly ranking up there, I think, at the moment. Thanks very much. We're running out of time, so if I can just conclude by thanking all of our speakers. They were all fantastic talks, and you gain a real insight into looking for a criminal traineeship. It is tough, but it's worthwhile, it's important, and we do have a responsibility to make sure people that want to enter the profession have the opportunity to do that. So thanks very much for a fantastic turnout. Thanks to the speaker. And Gordon, you're old enough to remember when Rangers Football Club were Rangers Football Club. You'll be able to they, watch the piece tonight. They, they, they still are, don't worry. <laughs> Matthew, I, I could just go as well, you were, were looking for a traineeship, you wouldn't get one with me, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> In all seriousness, thanks very much, everybody, and take care. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye.